Welcome everyone to Nice to Have and Need to Have Essential Data Management Best Practices and Tools for NIH Clients. My name is Mark Call. I am the product owner for Center for Open Science and will be moderating today's session. And with me, I have a bunch of well, work colleagues who are now my friends um, who will be speaking with us today. And with that, we're going to go on around and we're going to say exactly what our name is, where we work from, and I know something interesting about ourselves. Well, Stuart's got his hand up, so let's ask him first. Oh, I I must have accidentally clicked on that. But uh, <laughs> oh. um, anyway, so I'm Stuart Buck. I'm uh, the director of the Good Science Project, which is a small tank tank focused on improving federal science funding. Um, prior to that, I spent uh, many years in philanthropy at a place called Arnold Ventures um, and helped, uh, among other things, helped fund the Center for Open Science at, at its launch. So. Thanks. Awesome, thank you. Uh, let's go on with uh, Crystal. Hi, my name is Crystal Lewis. I am what I would call myself a research data manager. I've been doing this for about 10 years and I'm currently doing this in a freelance capacity, I'm consulting with people on uh, better ways to wrangle, document and share their research study data. So glad to be here. Thank you. Let's go with Nikki. Hi, thanks, Mark. Uh, I'm Nikki Pfeiffer. I'm the Chief Product Officer at the Center for Open Science, which is in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and I have the pleasure of working with researchers looking to adopt more open, transparent, and re reproducible practices into their research workflows. And I support a, a fabulous team of product designers, product owners, Mark being one, um, and software engineers in developing and maintaining our open source software tool, the Open Science Framework, uh, where we continually optimize the features and the workflows to support research management and collaboration, open and transparent research sharing, improving the rigor and quality of research with planning and pre-registration of study designs, and open scholarly communication. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, Nathaniel? Hi, I'm Nathaniel Backhoffer, Chief Product Officer at Trobase, platform for reproducible data management, data set collaboration. We host data, keep it secure, allow you to collaborate in a documented and readable way. We work on embedding best practices in our platform to ensure that you navigate your data management pipeline from configuration of your data set through to analysis in a best practices way. Uh, I'll talk more about best practice data management throughout this webinar. If you're working on a project now, you're, in, you're making your pipeline more reproducible. We'd love to have you get in touch with us. Uh, Sam will put a contact in the chat. We'd love to hear from you, whether you want to use our platform, whether you want to uh, use all the uh, other tools out there. Uh, we'd love to talk about uh, your project and how we can help. All right, and then Sam, speaking of which. Yeah, thanks. Well, hi, my name is Sam. I'm the CEO of Trophase. Nathaniel kind of covered what we do, but we're very excited to co-host this event today. I think I'm the only one who's going to say the fun fact. Um, the fun fact is that I am currently in Chimney, and that's the reason that I am not on video today. Um, the Wi-Fi isn't super stable, but I will be fielding your questions. So if you have questions throughout the presentation and throughout the panel discussion, feel free to pop it in the chat. And then once we get through the moderated discussion, I will field those questions to Mark and we'll hopefully get them all answered. So Looking forward to it. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thank you. So let's go ahead and start with context. Recently, recently, as in months, several, um, several ago, uh, the White House has put out an addendum saying that all the research that is going to be funded will be publicly available. NIH has also done very similar policies where it says that all the data is going to be publicly available. It's going to be required out of all those researchers that they have funded. And this is really transitioning the scientific community and their workflows to start adopting more open science best practices and really having them focus on um, data management best practices. Exactly how can they organize their data so that way it's digestible by other research teams. That way others can assess their rigor. They are able to reproduce those findings etc. Um, 
And actually, I want to pitch this over to Nikki, who understands all of that stuff, what it means, how it came to be, and be able to give us that context. So, Nikki, if you don't mind, I want to pitch it over to you so you can speak to about the White House, NIH, and how it's transforming the landscape. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I will do my best. This is pretty meaty uh, to talk through, and there's a lot of moving parts as as the policies are, are coming out and um, being sort of uh, trans, translated into practice and what does that look like across uh, the research landscape. So um, really quickly, just to kind of get the dialogue going, hopefully we'll get some really good questions and provide you with some insights um, as we wrap our heads around what these policy changes mean. Um, I'm just popping into the chat the actual memo from the White House that I'm referring to. So if you haven't had the uh, had a look at this or haven't looked at it recently, it's just an opportunity to, to go to the link and, and explore it some more. Um, but as Mark mentioned, this um, memo from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy uh, came out last year, and, and it is a statement that requires all federal agencies with research and development expenditures to update their public access policies by the end of 2025. Um, and given how quickly 2023 has already started to move, I feel like this will be here um, in the blink of an eye. And it means um, a lot of thinking um, and planning needs to happen to support the implementation. Um, so this does require that um, that publications that um, support data from federally funded research are made publicly accessible, no more embargoes, and that they are free and public um, for, uh, for, for anyone in the public to access. Um, it also calls out something I really um, am excited to see in a, in a statement like this. Um, it calls out the use of appropriate metadata. Um, so it's something that um, we talk a lot about that sharing um, scholarship or, or data results um, is, is fantastic. It's, it's the step in the right direction, but without good metadata, um, it really isn't the most effective way to spend your time. So just as much as you prepare the data, it's just as important to spend time preparing the metadata so that um, you know this is uh, easily accessed and cited um, to, you know, maximize the impact and reuse of, of that research. Um, but actually in the in this memo, they do cite some minimum metadata. Um, so I'm going to just mention those because I think at a, it's, it's important for us to spend some time on this to make sure that everybody understands what the minimum metadata is um, and to ensure that you're starting to prepare those aspects for um, any research that you're sharing. So it talks about authors and co-authors, their affiliations, the sources of funding um, that support the research, um, the publication dates, and specifically mentions the use of digital persistent identifiers on all the outputs and the use of digital persistent identifiers for all awards. Um, so that may be something we spend a little bit more time on, uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start moving through the other things that Mark uh, has asked me to share with everyone. Um, which is to go into a little bit more detail with the NIH, the National Institute of Health, um, and their specific policy. Um, so I just dropped the link to that um, on their website. And this talks about um, their plan, their policy requiring data management and sharing plans. Um, so this went into effect earlier this year. Um, so they're making progress on their uh, deadline of 2025 by rolling something out pretty, pretty quickly. Um, they have been working on this for some time, though. Um, and so this policy is meant to promote um, the sharing of scientific data to accelerate biomedical research discovery, um, enable the validation of research results, provide access to the data, and promote the data reuse. Um, so this requires that new research proposals include a data management and sharing plan alongside the research goals and anticipated outcomes. Um, they do specifically talk about a uh, plan and the budget uh, for managing and sharing of data, and that is um, definitely one aspect that uh, we talk a lot about with researchers, um, you know, and, and it is uh, a need to really think ahead about what it's going to take to um, prepare the, the data and the metadata alongside and find an appropriate repository um, where that can be uh, preserved and shared um, 
for many years in the future. Um, and so the last, um, I guess, aspect of this that I want to provide a link to um, is this one, which is mentioned um, in both of these um, as, as a sort of uh, tangential, but it is um, really good guidance that's come out uh, around the desirable characteristics of data repositories. Um, so for researchers that are really thinking about um, finding the right home for their data and, and the appropriate metadata to take a look at what um, the federal government um, and the NIH have pointed to as far as what you should be on the lookout for, what are the things to assess when um, looking at a repository. Um, so that that's just a, another valuable link, and a lot of um, a lot of the tools out there are um, complying with this, and so you know that's definitely something to look for on their websites or to, to try to inquire more about um, when you when you're choosing your appropriate repository. Um, so that's a bit of the landscape of the policy, um, and it definitely has impacts on on what you do um, within your research and and how you roll out um, some of these uh, aspects of compliance. And so I think we'll. Um, I'll turn it back to Mark to see if there's any anywhere else we want to go specifically around policy, or if we want to start talking about what this um, what this looks like in practice. Uh, you knocked it out of the park. I don't have any questions, but our audience might. So if you can, please pop those in the chat, and we will follow up on those later on. Um, there was one general question that I did have, which is we are not going to be sharing slides. This is more for discussion, um, but we do have lots of resources that are being populated in the chat. So feel free to go ahead and explore those while we have our conversations. Um, so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and start with a couple of questions that we have for our panelists that would, all of our teams get quite frequently. And this is open to the floor for any of the panelists. First question is, what do I need to do differently with the new NIH policy? Nick, you already said what the requirements are, but what do I need to do differently? Nikki, maybe you start and then we'll um, go around the, the panelists. So maybe Nikki and then next, Crystal. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and, I, you know, I think given a little bit more context, I might have a slightly different answer, but I would say, um, take a look at the data management and sharing um, template that the NIH puts out. It's a really good standard, um, no matter what your research discipline is, to say this really starts the thinking about what type of data um, and outputs you're going to produce as, as, as the outcomes of this research, the research you're planning to do. And I think just wrapping your head around those basic aspects and, and where and how you plan to um, archive and share those, um, those outputs, that can just get you started on the right thing. Um, and th I think from there, um, depending on what you determine as the outputs of the research and the types of data, the format, the volume, all of those aspects, um, then finding the correct um, home for that um, and, and taking a look at the desirable characteristics to find the appropriate repository. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. I also uh, put a link to the template that Nikki mentioned in the chat. I wasn't sure if that was in there, but um, I know two things that are kind of maybe a little different than maybe it was in the past when you submitted a grant for NIH, is that um, in the new plan, you have to explicitly state your plans for sharing data. So you can't kind of be iffy or fuzzy about that or say, you know, maybe I'll, maybe I'll share it in the future, maybe I won't. You have to be very explicit in the new plan. Um, and so that's one difference. And then um, having your data ready by a specified deadline is a kind of a new thing as well. So there's very specific deadlines about when you have to share your data. Um, either at the time of a publication or um, by the end of your grant. So those are two things that are going to be different than they were in the past. Anything Thank to you. chime in on, um, Stuart or Nathaniel? Um, I would just uh, second that point. Um, in the past, uh, data management plans have existed, but uh, Oftentimes, I mean, I've, I've heard someone who worked for NIH say some, that, you know, previously you could get away with a data management plan that simply said, I don't plan to share data. Um, and the, the NIH's first assistant director for data science, Phil Bourne, um, when he worked at NIH, he would, he would give public speeches. I heard him more than once say that the data management plans at that time were a joke. Um, that's his exact phrase, a joke. Um, so I think going forward, that's going to be a change. You can't 
get away with a, a data management plan that that's a joke anymore, <laughs> or that just says, I, I don't plan to share data. So there, um, that there are some serious expectations that are going to be uh, enforced. I think the most, what might be the, the most painful thing is not even necessarily writing up a data management plan, there are going to be templates for you, but it's just thinking carefully at the beginning what kind of data you're going to be producing. So that's part of the purpose of the policy is to get people thinking in advance what outputs they're producing. So having that all set up beforehand uh, rather than being able to figure it out on the fly as you're doing your research. Thank you. So let's say I am a researcher that has already started my research project. What do I have to change now? Anyone? Sam? No, I was just going to call on people. <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. I mean, I think it depends on if your grant is subject to the, the deadline, right? The January 25th deadline. So if it wasn't, if you did this before, you know, you're kind of working on old standards. If you're in the new grant, um, the new data management sharing policy, you're going to have these new standards that you're held to. So. All right, so what would I need to change? Go ahead, Crystal. Um, I mean, I think it's the same thing we already talked about. You know, you have to explicitly state and make plans for actually sharing your data or at least explaining why you cannot share your data if you cannot for certain reasons. Um, and then it, you're going to have to, you know, think heavily about data management so that you have your data ready in time to share it by the end of your project or by the end of your publication time, so. Yeah, just to follow up on that, uh, also what's interesting to me is the is that the requirement now is not just that you have to share data when, it's, when there's a publication or, or an article, uh, but that at the end of your grant period, you have to share, um, just a quote from the NIH's webpage, you have to share scientific data underlying findings not disseminated through peer reviewed journal articles. Um, so, so I think that's, that's something to really keep in mind throughout your grant that da scientific data that, that you produce during this grant, um, even if, you, even if you don't publish, you're still going to end up having to share that data. So you need to be thinking about that, uh, in advance and, you know, preserving that data as appropriately. Thank you. So thinking about best practices in the future to adhering to the NIH policy, where should I keep my data? Um, also considering such limitations such as IRB requirements and other requirements. All right, I'm gonna start doing what Sam said and just start picking on people. Yeah, just, just call people. Nathan, I haven't heard from you in a while. Do you have anything? Yes. So uh, the two big things, one is if you're at a research institution, then oftentimes your library will have a data services uh, branch with IT people uh, who will help you conform uh, to the standards that your uh, IRB has put down. Also, just in general, uh, best practice, uh, there's this term that uh, data security people, uh, the heuristic data security people like the three to one rule, having three copies of data on two different media with one copy off site. So basically having data that's securely stored on a cloud backup that sometimes your library can manage, having a physical piece of uh, a physical hard drive, for example, that you keep in the same place as you might keep your confidential forms, and then also having it. Uh, on your local machine uh, to work with in a way that other people can't access easily uh, without the login info that you have. See, I have not heard of that. So that is a phenomenal idea that really helps with preservation. Stuart, Chris, yeah, did you I, that? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say that you, um, you know, I think the two, the two people you wanna talk to for storing your data is your IRB and you're in your institution, right? Because they'll have certain approved tools that they'll want you to use. Um, and, and like Nathan said, you want to think about things like regular backups of data to keep data secure. You need to think about all your legal and ethical mandates, um, HIPAA, FERPA, all those good things. Um, you know, a, a storage space with a sufficient size, one that meets the needs of your project. You know, not all data collection and 
stored tools are created equal. Not all of them are HIPAA compliant, so you need to look into that because it needs to have necessary controls to ensure confidentiality, you know, integrity, that kind of thing, encryption, password protection, all those good things, depending on the sensitive level of your data. So there's a lot to think about for sure. See, and Nikki's kind of already beat me to the curb with um, my next question, which is, uh, so as uh, Nathan said, we need to have like approximately two different places to be able to store our data, et cetera. How, what would help me choose what is the best, not medium, but area to be able to store my data, rather than that it has uh, sensitive data, like you mentioned HIPAA versus non-sensitive data? What are some things I need to keep in the back of my head? Yeah, so really the sensitive data is going to be, it, the sensitive data and the regulations that you have to comply with are going to be really important. If your data aren't sensitive, then the thing, uh, then it's just about backups. Then it's just about the main priority is making sure you don't lose things and making sure your versioning doesn't get out of sync so you don't understand, uh, so that there's no issue where you don't understand which version of the data uh, came at what point. And so for that, you can use uh, something like more conventional like Dropbox, like Google Drive, uh, to, uh, to keep that integrity. Once security becomes more of an issue, then you want to use things, uh, use more professional tooling. Uh, you can use something like Amazon Web Services, which is uh, designed to be HIPAA compliant. Uh, our platform, Trobase, we're working on making sure that we have all the HIPAA compliance, so uh, you can use us. But even if, you, if it's not HIPAA per se, you still uh, want to either go through your institution or use uh, one of these cloud services uh, that does emphasize security uh, to make sure that people can't aren't just sharing links, some open link on Amazon AWS S3 or Google Drive, and just anyone with a link can open it kind of thing. You want to avoid that because that can lead to big issues down the line if someone just has that link lying around somewhere. And just really quick, I want to chime in. Um, Sherry said something interesting in the chat. Um, storing or sharing, that can be different. Um, do you want to just mention or, or comment on that? Yeah, so uh, there's going to be in your data management plan, you're going to talk about even if you have some, some parts of your data that are sensitive, there's going to be, the NIH is going to want you to try to share de-identified data. So, uh, one way to do that is to, at the end of everything, take the piece, pieces of your data that are, and, and make sure that they're de-identified and then uh, share that on something public like OSF or BigShare or Electrobase, or uh, use um, a, a platform. One thing, if you're a little bit more technical, you can try to be adventurous and, and have restrictions on uh, particular variables in your data that are identifying. It's something that uh, we're working on implementing as a platform, but there are uh, other services which will allow you to take specific, if you split up your data and say, these are the, this is the part of my data which identifies who the subjects are. This is, these are the data observations. Then you can not, you can release one data file and not the other. Uh, and that way you don't, you, do the, you don't have to do the identification later on because uh, you've constructed your data in such a way uh, so that no, there's no leakage uh, that happens. Crystal Stewart, Nikki, have anything to expand on? I just will speak to the couple of links that I dropped in the chat um, to try to get it. Um, this is a tough question about where is the best place to share data. Um, or discover data if you're at the other uh, point in the process where you're um, developing a proposal or a research question. Um, obviously, um, part of the, the goal with sharing is to reuse and build on the large corpus of, of open data that's available. And so obviously, 
accessing that is 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 an important um, component. So um, again, there are different types of repositories. Um, so just to focus in on NIH's approach, um, because they have rolled out a policy, they have different um, institutes and centers that uh, also operate um, and, and maintain their own types of data repositories, typically domain specific. And so those are um, very good options to consider. But sometimes um, a generous repository is more appropriate, depending on the type of, of data or a, another domain specific repository that's not necessarily operated by um, the government uh, agencies um, that you might be receiving your funding fr from. So just to explore the full landscape, I've given you a couple of links um, there. And to say that sometimes, and this is um, this is kind of getting into a, a somewhat of a tricky um, situation where multiple copies of a data set might exist out in the wild, and that can be problematic. And so understanding when and why and how you should you should do that. What are some of the specific considerations? Like you like you're saying, if you do have um, sensitive data or things that need to have a very closed access loop um, that might live in one place, but there could be anonymized or um, other aspects of the data that can be shared openly. Um, and how do you um, point to the other um, versions of the data effectively and um, even support um, harmonization for, for somebody that has full access across all the different um, points of data. So just to kind of point that out, um, those are key aspects. There's some good guidance on some of these uh, links that I've provided. We can also talk more about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think really focus in on the domain for um, of the research uh, that you, that your data should should reside in, and trying to make sure that those researchers can find it easily. Yeah, I was just going to add those are those are great links. Um, NIH uh, webpage that uh, actually I dropped a, the same link uh, as she did into the chat. But um, yeah, they have over 130, I think, uh, NIH supported data repositories that are very often very specialized. I mean, there's a data repository just for zebrafish genomic data um, or just for fly genomic data or just for worm genomic data or just for yeast genomic data. I mean, it goes on and on. Uh, and, and then some generalist repositories as well. Uh, but that doesn't even exhaust uh, the uh, number of repositories out there. Um, the registry of, let's see, what are, registry of research data repositories, they have uh, in their search um, over 3000 results. Um, of data repositories around the world. Most, many of them may not be relevant to NIH, but uh, it looks like there's a data repository for just about any type of data or subject or field that you can think of. So, um, so yeah, just, uh, use the search function, I would suggest. Don't try to browse 3000 results. <laughs> yeah, that would get exhausting very quickly. So we've been using the catchphrase best practices quite a bit. I'm curious. What do we actually mean when we say best practices when it's around data management and creating those data plans? I'm happy to chime in here. Um, so like, yeah, best practices or good practices um, usually are ones that produce accessible, reliable, and quality data, I think is what we're hoping for, for both the research team that's doing the project as well as future data users as well, right? Um, and NIH actually specifically calls out a couple of data management practices um, validation, organization, um, protection, and then maintaining and processing scientific data. So these are things that they expect you to do with your data. Um, so even if, I think Stuart mentioned this earlier, even if maybe you're not sharing all of your data for maybe ethical, legal, or technical reasons, they still expect you to manage all of that data. Um, and so, and now, like I mentioned earlier, because researchers are required to share their data either at the time of publication or by the end of their grant, um, you know, teams can no longer wait to manage their data until the end. They need to be managing throughout the entire life cycle. Um, so data management needs to start at the very beginning of your project and then be integrated into your daily kind of project management workflow. Um, and it should be a part of everyone's routine. Um, I don't know if you want me to go. I, I don't want to, you know, take over <laughs> this space if anybody wants to talk about it. particular data management practices. I'm happy to continue. <laughs> Um, I want to dig into that, but sure. Does yeah. anyone else have anything to yeah. <laughs> we dig into that? I'm hearing silence. Crystal, the floor is yours. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah. So, this means that things like um, 
documentation, data cleaning, you know, if you're working with human subjects data, de-identification, data validation, these are all happening throughout your project, not just at the end of your project. Um, but all this needs to keep in mind the end goal, which is data sharing, um, to make sure things like, um, you know, if you're working with human subject data that you in, uh, include some language about data sharing into your consent form so that you're prepared for data sharing at the end. Um, and also organizing your data and documentation in a fair manner, which you'll see throughout the NIH language, um, making sure that your data is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and so, you know, the first thing you need to have, according to this policy, is a plan, right? So you need to have your data management and sharing plan, which is about, you know, two pages or so. But even on top of that, you want to have a really detailed plan once you're awarded your grant, where, like, roles and responsibilities are formally laid out. Um, a workflow design that so that staff know exactly what they should be doing and when in terms of data management. Um, so some practices that come to my mind that you'll want to implement into um, your workflow would be using data standards. So if uh, standards exist in your field, you want to implement those. If they don't, create some standards for your project so that they're implemented throughout your project. So standards for things like naming your files, formatting your files, versioning your files, naming variables, those kind of things. Um, so they're done consistently throughout your project, describing your data as well. Um, and then one thing I'm sure Nathan would agree with is that you want to collect quality data from the beginning, <laughs> not collect bad data and then have to clean it up later at the end. You want to have good practices in from the beginning. Um, and also store your data in a way like we talked about that prevents you from losing it with that 3 two, one rule um, and also risking breaches of confidentiality. And you want to document everything, all of your decisions and processes. And um, you want to document throughout your project. Keep a record of that. That kind of helps you um, have data provenance, right? So you know where your data comes from and what kind of manipulations have been done to it along the way. Um, and then the last thing I'll say <laughs> is that you want to check everything throughout your process. So you know, build data validation into your workflow. Check check your data as you're collecting it and see if anything looks off, so that you can catch it early on. You know, check it as you're cleaning it, so that you can see if anything looks off. Um, and so again, these all these practices are part of your entire data management workflow throughout the whole project so that you're ready to go as soon as you need to share that data at the end of the project. I love how you listed that. All I need now is like a little checklist. That way every step of the scientific process will be like, yep, got that done, got that done, and keep on going. Just to make sure everything's nice and clean. Does anyone have anything to expand on before I go to our next question? I mean, just the way I summarize it, one. Crystal's book draft, which she didn't plug, but I will plug, is fantastic. Uh, and you can see it online, it's, it's great. And you're just documenting everything is, is so key and do, using standardization as much as possible uh, in your workflow. And, uh, and then use Crystal's book to do that checklist. All right, so I have a hypothetical question for you. Aside the fact that it is uh, required now, or soon to be required by White House NIH, why do I even need a data management plan to begin with? So you just wanna take that one. Are we just gonna say it was NIH and then that's the only reason? I mean, I think there's a, a myriad of reasons to manage your data, right? The benefits are far beyond what's required of you. <laughs> um, you know, I could go on and on about it, but it's, you know, it's, it benefits you, it benefits your team, it benefits society. So, you know, it's not just about like checking the box for the requirement, right? So it's about all the benefits you receive from managing your data. So, Yeah, I'll say something that comes with experience is that collaborating with your past self, it can be a horrible experience and that you, you can be your, your most frustrating collaborator. So having a data management plan, if nothing else, even about there's collaboration with other people, there's the impact that your work makes, there's other people, there's the better science, but something that should be compelling to everyone is that if you have a good data management plan to start with, then your future self will be grateful. Great, great minds think alike because I just I just posted a link in the chat to a Twitter discussion of the origin of some of the phrase or the joke that your most important collaborator is yourself from six months ago. And unfortunately, yourself from six months ago can't answer your emails. So, um, uh, yeah, so I think it's it's really all about 
I mean, it's really in your own self-interest, I think, to, to, you know, successfully and, and, you know, manage your data. Um, because I mean, it, it, if you've ever worked with data or, or code for that matter, um, and you've set aside a project for six months or a year and then come back to it, you can find yourself just really scratching your head, trying to figure out what was I doing here? What did this variable mean? What, what, you know, trying to recreate that knowledge, it, it, it vanishes pretty quickly if you shift to another project. So it's really in everyone's self-interest to, uh, really thoroughly document and manage both data and code uh, really effectively. I think one of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite terms is uh, data curation debt. I can't even remember where I got it from, but um, somebody had written about it. And it's that debt that you incur from just waiting until the end of your project to manage your data and all the things that you have to deal with. And maybe it's lost data even, you know, or you don't even know how to use your data anymore. And so we're trying to reduce that data curation debt by starting the management from the beginning of the project. So. Awesome. Well, I was trying to kind of get to if I can just avoid all the federal grants I have to work with NIH or White House, why should I even do data management best practices? And you guys can already answered that. So again, you guys are ahead of me. Um, all right. So let's say that I'm working with a team, but they're not really adopting those best practices. How do I get my non-technical team to adopt those best practices? So I've thought about this a lot, <laughs> having worked with a lot of teams. It is difficult, um, I think, to get that buy-in, you know? And I think one thing that's huge is that you need a champion on your team. So somebody who wholeheartedly believes in the benefits of data management and can kind of sell that to the team. Um, because a lot of us aren't trained data management and so we're not used to implementing these practices. And so it's very new and it seems like extra work. But helping your team understand the benefits of them and understanding these aren't just formalities, they actually have real benefits. Um, and getting them to believe in that is really important. Um, and then again, getting them to integrate that into work their workflow so that it's not just extra work, it's just part of their normal routine is huge. Um, you know, that might require training, it might require periodic check-ins, or maybe it requires some oversight, um, but it eventually just becomes a part of everyone's routine. I'll also just put in a, a brief plug with what we're working on at Trobase is that part of the purpose of our platform is to make it easier for non-technical people to take up these best practices by embedding the best practices in the platform. So when you configure your data set, these validations, Crystal come, uh, talked about earlier, come along automatically, variable names are standardized, things like that. Right. And I'm actually going to pick on Nikki a little bit which is as the director of product, I'm sure you're in a lot of conversations with different stakeholders as well. What are some of their barriers they've had of adopting best practices around data management? Um, yeah, it's a great question. I think stakeholders um, have a lot to manage. And so I think one of the barriers is just finding easy ways to track um, the compliance and, and tools that can support easy uh, validation and reporting um, to just enable them to streamline the overhead and the management time, I think is the biggest win for them. Um, I think some of the things we're getting at um, and have dropped some links in are also useful. So guiding um, research teams and identifying the best repository or other tools they need to utilize. Um, there's a plethora of them out there. And so um, good, you know, good uh, sort of search and discovery tools for them to find or even recommending the, the best ones um, given experience. I think those are some some of the tools we've dropped links into. And I think the, the other one that was mentioned, and um, I've seen lots of examples of this, but it may be um, actually a good thing to try to curate more of them um, in a single place is checklists. I think um, having a, a guided checklist that can help a research team really embrace those best practices have a clear set of everything they need to pay attention to and at what point they've accomplished that or where they are in that journey. I think that really helps like minimize some of the anxiety and the like overwhelming feeling of like, oh my gosh, I have a lot to take on. Um, 
to meet this aspect of, of my research. I just want to go do the research. I just want to answer the, the research question is mostly what's on their mind. And this stuff um, just feels like a lot of administrative burden. And so I think the more we can reduce some of that, obviously better workflows in the tools that they use to streamline those aspects as well. But I think um, just curation of some checklists and, and good tool sets for them uh, would be the best thing I could say. Thank you. All right, I have one final question before I pitch it over to Sam for some Q and A's, which is, so I put in all this time and effort to build my data set and now it, it, it's available. I've done everything that I need to do, but I'm concerned that others are gonna get credit for working with data that I've, I've collected and data that I've made available. What should I do to make sure that I get the credit that is due to me? I'm gonna start picking on people. Stuart, hey, I heard from you in a bit. Um, I mean, I think my understanding is there are various like uh, licenses that you could you could put on your data that say, you know, you can use this with attribution. Um, so uh, Creative Commons licenses and so forth. Um, but but I mean, it's it's hard to to do this on your own. I mean, it's kind of a collective uh, action problem. Like we need better practices across you know, so across scientists and across disciplines about citing data and citing where your where your source was, and then about giving appropriate credit. Um, you know, academic institutions need to do a better job of, you know, for example, saying, you know, if, if you create a data set that 10 other scientists found useful for their publications, that should count at least something uh, towards your own kind of academic career, as opposed to just you generating another publication for yourself. You were generating a data set that was useful to the field, and that, that, should, that should count more than it does today. Well said. Anyone have to expand beyond that? All right. That was my final question. Sam, I'm going to pitch it over to you with the Q&As. Thank you. Cool. Um, so just a reminder, we, we have some uh, questions in the chat now and some have uh, asked them via the Q&A feature. So if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat now. We'll try to get to all of them. Um, the first one that I, that I think that we should start with is um, are researchers with more resources and people going to be more prepared for this change? So basically, how do younger PIs or maybe PIs with less resources um, balance compliance and cost and doing research? Nikki, maybe? Um, sure. I think the thing here is that they may be slightly disadvantaged in that they're early in, in their career. They haven't maybe run a, a research study fully on their own or um, have only been minimally involved in some aspects of the whole planning and, and the full like cycle. So for them to fill out um, one of these plans and to budget effectively, I think is where they may um, actually need more support. Um, not to say that that, ha to, in my mind, is not necessarily um, based on the resources um, of their institution. It's just um, overall experience that they, they, may, they may not have. And so I think, like I said, having more curated um, checklists and tools um, to guide them and to provide some, some good ways of estimation and, and thinking through the, the aspects they need to pull together might be the only um, path that, but also uh, more experienced PIs that haven't had to fill out a, a data management and sharing plan or actually put that into their budget are in the same, are in the same place. So um, I think that's, that's the aspect to address. Anyone else before moving on to the next? Um, I was just gonna mention that to definitely talk to your um, librarians they're excellent resources if you're at a university. Um, they're, they're literally experts in this stuff. So <laughs> helping you develop budgets, you know, helping you develop plans, they're, they're great resources for you to work with, so. Um, a new question from the chat is, when reviewing rationale for data that can't be shared, how do we limit this to legitimate reasons? Um, and the follow-up is, 
We currently ask them to use the NIH safe harbor techniques to de-identify, but we always get pushed back um, using someone else's data and they don't have consent to share, et cetera. So basically, um, are there legitimate reasons and um, how do you state those legitimate reasons for why data can't be shared? And maybe the answer is we don't know. I, I think, I mean, I feel like the NIH has a lot of documentation about reasons you can and cannot um, give to share data. So I think, you know, things like small sample sizes or there's no good data repositories for me are bad reasons. Um, but, you know, having de-identification issues seems like a really good reason to not share. So I, I feel like that would be something that NIH would be okay with. Because um, throughout all our documentation, they say there's going to be reasons why you can't share data for technical or legal reasons or ethical reasons, and they understand that. So I, I think that um, this would be something they would they would understand, but I could be wrong. <laughs> yeah, and they do have templates, which have examples of cases where people will have a data management plan uh, where they'll say, we can't have, we can't share this data publicly. Um, a question from, from earlier when we were talking about best practices. Um, one question from that segment was, what about the use of version control to keep steps of data manipulation? Um, is, is that considered a best practice? I, yeah, I think it absolutely is. If, it, if you're in a field that that's um, something you can use. So, you know, um, I, I work with education research and we work with a lot of identifiable data. And so, you know, we're not typically working with pushing things to GitHub or working with Git. Um, and so we might be doing more like manual versioning of things, but if you are in a field that doesn't have that kind of issue or you're working with a tool that allows you to work with identifiable data and also version it, that's awesome. Um, automated versioning is always probably preferred to manual versioning. So Nathan, you probably have more to say about that. But <laughs> yeah, and so that's one of the things that we have with Trobase is that we have the automated versioning combined with uh, those security privacy permissions uh, constraints. So you can have both of those things. Um, using tools like Git, it's a gold standard for what programmers like. Uh, and there are graphical interfaces which make it easier. I personally like uh, Git Kraken, there's GitHub Desktop. Um, but in order for you to get a lot of the benefits of version control, you don't necessarily have to use tools like Git. Uh, you can obviously use the tool that we built, but you can also just be deliberate about uh, naming things, about uh, documenting different versions, and that can get you uh, a lot of the way to the benefits of having version control, uh, which once you are on a project that does use it effectively, you are never going to want to do it any other way. Yes, yeah, so you can... You can like he mentioned na naming things by versioning it, you know, you can name it by date or version it by, you know, version 01, 02, and keep kind of like a change log of your versions. I think doing one of those is absolutely necessary, whether it's manual or automated, so. Okay, um, another question is, um, I am the DMS compliance person at EVMS, not a scientist. How important is it to match the research data source to the repository? My PIs frequently don't have a clue as to which repository to choose. Sorry, I, if I'm following, are you, are you talking about like how important is it to choose like a domain specific repository? Is that what? Um, let me scroll up and see. If, I, if the person's still on, maybe you can. Oh, somebody said yeah, yes. Yeah. I think NIH heavily says to try to get a domain-specific repository. I think Nikki mentioned this. It's it's important for your people in your field to be able to find the data that's relative, related to your field. <laughs> um, but there, they do give plenty of options for generalist repositories if there's not something specific for your domain. Yeah, and those do have a purpose. And it's not just about like, we want to keep this kind of data in, in this particular place. These repositories have features that make it easier to index projects that are uh, uploaded to them. So that way people can search within those repositories in a way to 
rapidly get uh, the projects that are relevant to them. Okay, and then maybe we have time for just a couple more. Um, let me scroll, hang on one second. Okay, um, how likely CDISC standards can be adapted for generalization of open research? If someone hears uh, the new term SDIC standards, it's a working group that makes clinical research more traceable and reproducible. Um, I'm not sure who asked that. But any, any comments or do we need some more clarification about that question? Hmm. I, I'm not an expert on this at all, but CDISC, I know is a, it stands for Clinical Data Interchange Studies Consortium or something like that. It's, it's about basically clinical, clinical trial data in medicine or, or you know, clinical data for medicine. Um, and I know it's a set of standards that like the FDA expects when you, you know, submit, uh, you know, data and information, uh, you know, supporting, you know, like a new pharmaceutical, that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, in theory, you know, that's, that's the kind of thing that hopefully is useful both for clinical data, but, it, you know, having kind of a, an agreed upon set of data standards uh, is, is a great idea in any discipline, really. And I think that's why using the discipline specific repositories is, is you know, heavily favored um, because, you know, if, if you share data in the, in the right format and um, that everyone else in your field is using, it's going to be a lot easier uh, for others to access and find and, and reuse. Uh, than if you do it in your own kind of bespoke format. So. And then since we just have about five minutes left, maybe we could go around to each panelist um, and just see if there's any you know, last minute um, comments that you, that you want to add, or maybe if there was a question that you anticipated that wasn't asked, um, that you can uh, go around and give some, some final thoughts, um, maybe starting with Nikki. Yeah, um, I guess the only other thing I was thinking about, um, the OSF is part of uh, an initiative with the NIH called the Generous Repository Ecosystem Initiative, where multiple generous repositories are, are coming together to support several aspects of the data management and sharing policy implementation. And so one of the things I just... Um, really have appreciated from, from this discussion is, is just a continued sort of elevation of these questions that are coming from across sort of the community and what some of the needs are. Um, and so hearing just more about the need for good guides and checklists and a good set of resources to help identify the best uh, repository for data continues to rise to the top. And that's not unique. We've had, um, last year, we had a series of webinars about this. We had a workshop at the beginning of the year. Um, it just continues to be um, one of the things that uh, are still finding um, challenging. And so there's a lot of different nuances to the data um, that the community is generating. And so just to continue to support that. Um, so I just want to kind of thank you for, for the great questions and the great discussion. Um, and it is something that we're uh, actively trying to, you know, pursue good um, tools and resources for this community. I guess I'll jump in. <laughs> I, I don't think I have anything else to add except for just to make sure that you are, you know, budgeting for, um, you know, this data management and sharing um, specifically because you're going to have to really concentrate on managing data throughout the whole life cycle. So you're going to need to budget for that. So, you know, that NIH expects that they want you to budget for it. So just make sure that you add that in there um, for, for personnel, you know, for repository costs, you know, for you know, certain kind of infrastructure, that kind of stuff. So documentation, that kind of thing. That's it. Thank you all. I would add that um, re the, the, what we've been talking about, data management, goes hand in hand with best practices in, uh, in the code that you use to analyze your data. So thinking about uh, reproducibility of the entire scientific process, we've been emphasizing particularly about the data input to that. 
but also these kinds of things we're talking about, like standardization and version control and being able to share uh, what you're doing applies just as much uh, to the code. And the ideal that we have there is that you can hand over your project to collaborators or to a stranger, and they'll be able to take your data, take your code, run it, and be able to get the same graphs and tables uh, that you have uh, in your published version. Nathaniel, Stuart, do you have any last minute comments? Yeah, just to reaffirm that while it's it's easy to look at all these new requirements and rules and, and think of it as a burden, uh, I would urge folks to just think about building this into the, the life cycle of your work uh, and your workflow. And ultimately, hopefully, once it becomes like just a, a, a habit, a way of doing things, uh, you know, everyone will benefit. You, you yourself will benefit it when you return to a project after you know taking a, a break from it, or perhaps if a new person joins your lab or your team and they need to be brought up to speed and you don't have to reinvent the wheel and try to figure out, you know, how on earth do we document things around here? You said there's a, a more of a organized process and workflow for getting that new team member up to speed. And I think, you know, in the end, hopefully everyone benefits. All right. In that case, I want to say thank you to Sam and all the panelists for today and this incredible discussion. This has been incredibly insightful for me. Um, for those that are still on the call, you will find a copy of this recording here on our YouTube channel, as well as all the links that were shared in our chat today. And there we can continue having that conversation. And so with that, thank you all the attendees and thank you all the panelists. I appreciate it. You guys have a great day.